And uh, the next uh, presenter is uh, Steve Compton again, and he's going to talk to us a little bit more about other features for identifying Kogan grass. So we hope you get something out of this, and it'll help you in seeing what you actually or identifying what you see. Steve, thank you, George. Um, some of the things, some of the slides that I have to show you here are things that have already been talked about, but I thought it might be good to have some close-ups and some uh, photographs that are actually taken in South Carolina, and this will give you again an idea of what what we're facing. Uh, this particular slide that we're looking at here is from Fred Singleton, a DPI inspector, and he made this photograph at the Hampton site. Uh, this is just up above the area that we showed previously where the uh, the uh, right away in the power lines this one actually encroached into someone's yard and the gentleman was most happy to have us come in and uh, treat it um, last week we did uh, get a call and say that it's starting to come up again and he's the landowner is very um, he's very very happy that we're there to help him get rid of this particular plant Uh, we showed you earlier the picture of the Kogan grass in the Francis Marion forest, and you can see how robust it is. I'm going to go through these very quickly. Here again is the uh, Kogan grass. It's in shrubbery, so it may not always look alike when you see it, so pay attention to the characteristics that Patrick mentioned and that George talked about earlier. And you'll notice that uh, sometimes the seed head's not all fluffy. This particular photograph by DPI inspector that's holding the seed heads, those have not completely opened. So depending on the time of the year that you look at it, or if it's been chemically treated or if it's been mowed, it may look different uh, from those fluffy open heads that you're seeing. So be aware that there can be some variation uh, depending on the stage of the flower. I'm going to show you a few photographs that uh, came about from going to uh, Mobile, Alabama, where they have severe infestations. As a matter of fact, if you ride down Interstate 65, you can see where the Alabama DOT has treated large, large areas. And they're spraying massive amounts to keep it out of the right-of-way because they don't want trucks uh, blowing the seed up and dispersing it to other states. We commend Alabama for their attempts to fight this. This is kind of the opposite from what we're seeing in Florida. Unfortunately, uh, Florida's become so infested with it, they've pretty much given up on the fight. And recently, while I was in Florida, uh, I saw tractor trailers parked with their engines running in stands of Kogan grass, and their grills were full of seed. So uh, hopefully our neighbor will... Uh, change their minds. Uh, while we were in Mobile, we took a track hoe, and uh, everybody kept saying it grows four feet into the earth, and uh, that was kind of hard for me to believe, but sure enough, this is a photograph of a clump of Kogan grass that was dug with a, a track hoe, and at four feet, uh, there were still rhizomes in the earth, so this is probably one of the reasons that it's very hard to get chemical to travel that far down into the tips of this, these rhizomes that are uh, going so deep into the earth. Uh, the chemicals that have been used, uh, uh, they're just not being translocated all the way to the bottom. So once that little tip's left, then after a while it has a chance to uh, start growing again and if it's not continuously treated then eventually it'll end up growing into a new kogan grass plant now we think we got a problem uh this could be our problem but fortunately this is in mobile alabama and if you look at this area that has been pretty much dominated by uh, the kogan grass you can see that there's one pine tree 
And then if you look very close, there's one little uh, sprig of uh, broom sedge sticking up. Uh, pretty much I looked around through this grass and I saw nothing there except for kogan grass. And this is so thick that I don't think you could even mow it with a bush hog. Or it'd have to be a mighty mean bush hog to do that. Here's another photograph to give you an idea of some large expanse. Uh, what can happen when it's not controlled. And uh, it's pretty well entrenched itself in this area here. This is also a photograph from the Mobile area. Now we're back to South Carolina and we talked again about the fire regime. Uh, this is in the Francis Marion and this was during the winter. And uh, you can see what happens. This would be pretty much like gasoline burning with that caught on fire. And again, uh, in the pine ecosystem there where the control burn is important to keep native plants and to keep the understory clean. Uh, it would be almost impossible to have a controlled burn fire here because if you did, you would destroy the trees. This is a close up. This gives you a good reference. Having my, I took this one at the uh, where the trucks were parked uh, in Florida. Uh, this was right beside one of the tractor trailers that was running, but the seed heads were opening and the, they were starting to float around. And I put my hand in, in the photograph while I took the picture to give you a reference of the size. So please note that because there are some uh, grasses out there that are uh, that have fluffy little heads on them, but they they're not that big and uh, they're not quite that fluffy. So this is a good good photograph. It'll give you some references to the size of the. Uh, they Patrick uh, spoke about the offset midrib. Uh, this is showing a, a real good example. I found this particular leaf uh, in the Francis Marion forest and it shows very well the offset midrib and I even took a ruler so if you're going out and you're going to be doing survey work, ruler might be something. Uh, George will go over some tools that you might want in your toolbox with you as you travel but a ruler might be a good idea if he doesn't mention that. I don't know if he will but a ruler might be a good thing to have along with you so that you can determine. And one thing about the midrib being offset, uh, I've noticed that it tends to be offset more towards the tip of the leaf than it does at the base of the leaf. Uh, this is some of the chemicals that are required to do kogan grass uh, control. Uh, this is actually in Mobile and this was in the area that they were working on and um, they were using uh, glyphosate and arsenal and they were putting blue dye in it so they could tell where they had sprayed and uh, they I asked him about the cost per acre and he he wrote down the amounts on the containers which I thought was kind of interesting but I found out that that was for him to make one tank mix which uh, wasn't enough to cover an acre but he said that to spray an acre that it was to one time was costing about uh, 90 to to $100. And that if uh, you had to spray twice a year, then you're looking at close to $200 if by the time you buy fuel and, and you count your labor into that. So it gets quite expensive. So uh, we don't want that in our state. While we're doing the survey on uh, Kogan grass, uh, there are a couple of other plants that I'm just going to mention briefly and uh, because um, it's important while we're out surveying that we know what these plants look like because they are also very invasive and one of them is tropical soda apple and we have scattered throughout about 17,000 acres in South Carolina small infestations of tropical soda apple and we do have an ongoing eradication program. We have good chemicals that will eliminate it. The problem with tropical soda apple is once the seed drop to the earth, we know that they're viable for 10 years. And the chemicals that we use to spray the plant with do not control the uh, tropical soda apple. Uh, probably the time of year that we're doing the survey, this is probably more what the tropical soda apple might look like. Probably.